Good evening, everyone, uh, and welcome to the ninth public lecture hosted by NUS Cities. For those who don't know about NUS Cities, we are a university-wide, multidisciplinary, open and inclusive collaborative platform hosted within the College of Design and Engineering. Through our collaborations with local and international institutions, we hope to create synergies that extend within as well as beyond NUS. The NUS Cities Public Lecture Series will investigate policies, ideas, and projects developed by urban experts, which aspire to create sustainable, resilient, and livable cities. Through the lecture series, we hope to create a platform for discussion, retrospection, and conversation to give momentum to the ongoing research and exploration regarding issues concerning cities. I would now like to introduce our speaker of the evening. Mr. Jonathan Rose's business, public policy, teaching, research, writing, and non-for-profit work focuses on creating more environmentally, socially, and economically resilient cities. In 1989, Mr. Rose founded Jonathan Rose Companies, a multidisciplinary real estate development and investment firm, to address the challenges of the poor distribution of opportunity through the development of affordable and mixed income housing. He has led the firm's vision, strategy, and growth, developing award-winning new projects, investment funds, and city plans that model solutions to address the issues of community development, opportunity, inequality, and the environment. The firm's innovative work has won awards from a wide range of notable organizations, including the Urban Land Institute, the National Trust for Historic Preservation, the Natural Resources Defense Council, the American Planning Association, and the American Institute of Architects. Mr. Rose was selected as winner of the 2021 ULI Prize for Visionaries in Urban Development. His book on how to create resilient cities, titled The Well-Tempered City, was published by Harper Wave in 2016 and won the 2017 Prose Award for Outstanding Scholarly Work by a trade publisher. Mr. Rose and his wife, Diana Kaltrop Rose, are the co-founders of the Garrison Institute, and he serves as chair on this board. The Institute connects inner transformation with outer solutions to relieve sufferings in the fields of trauma, education, and the environment. Mr. Rose graduated from Yale University in 1974 with a BA in psychology and philosophy and received a master's in regional planning from the University of Pennsylvania in 1980. I now pass my time to Mr. Rose. Uh, however, I would like to highlight to the audience that the Q&A portal is open for questions, so please do send in your questions during your lecture as well. Thank you so much, Andrina, and um, welcome in U.S. audience. By the way, uh, you mentioned that uh, I attended Yale, <clears throat> and I'm so happy that NUS has a Yale NUS program. Um, so, are you seeing my screen? Uh, yes. Good. Perfect. Okay. Uh, but it's not full screen yet. It will be in, uh, how's that? Is it full screen? Perfect, yes. Okay, great. All right. Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna talk about cities today. Uh, the world is very rapidly urbanizing. And uh, so uh, cities are a key part of not only the current part of uh, human occupation of the earth, but very much the future. And we're seeing extraordinary cities being built. And Singapore certainly is one of the most extraordinary uh, and best models of cities in the world. We're also seeing that this growth can be very rapid. And this is Karachi. And that um, uh, more uh, and growing more quickly than actually we have plans and systems to accommodate the growth. And so we're seeing things, for example, like uh, Chinese, uh, China's amazing high-speed rail system that interconnects its cities. And we're seeing transportation systems that are overwhelmed by old, out-of-date transportation systems, overwhelmed by need. Um, the world is also very rapidly materializing. So as people become more middle class, they're consuming an enormous amount. And that consumption has very negative effects on the earth. So first of all, climate, the burning of coal to provide power, uh, climate change is uh, an increasingly, uh, extremely serious problem. Um, it's causing floods, it's causing droughts, uh, and we're also seeing uh, an increase in interstate violence. Um, many of the 
wars that have been created around the world are often about resource at the core, although, uh, and this happens to be a photo of Syria, but obviously we have this incredible conflict, uh, uh, painful to see conflict going on in Gaza right now. Um, and so the world is also becoming more um, polarized, more disruptive, and more uh, at, a, at a tipping point in, of uncertainty in which violence is more likely to break out. We're also seeing uh, an increase in income inequality. This has happened and been happening for quite some time. This is a picture of the riots that took place in London in 2011. They were quite unexpected. This map of London, the deeper the red, the deeper the poverty. And what you see is that, the, and the Google points show the places where the riots took place, and they didn't take place in the poorest areas of the city. They took place actually where the lower middle class was meeting the middle class and the mostly immigrant population, but the populations felt like there's an invisible barrier of opportunity that they just could not cross. And this is gonna be a key theme of this talk, which is about what we're calling the landscape of opportunity. Uh, just as this map shows areas of greater and lesser poverty, in most cities, uh, poverty and opportunity are geographically distributed. There are neighborhoods with very good schools and neighborhoods with not so good schools, neighborhoods with very good health care, neighborhoods with less good health care. And one of my theories is, if you take away one thing from this lecture, is that the purpose of a city must be, amongst other things, to equalize this landscape of opportunity. That if every resident of a city feels like they have a chance to be have their kids well educated and for them to advance in the job and have a good home and to move forward. It, it, it provides, uh, that's in many ways, I think one of the key purposes of cities. This is a map of intergenerational opportunity in the United States. So uh, if you were born in 1940 and turned 26 in 1966, 1966 was the peak of opportunity in the United States. If you're born then, if you're born into the bottom quartile of income, no matter what race, by the time you turn 26, you were 90% more likely to have a higher income than your low-income parents. If you were born in 2016 and turned 26 in 2000, I'm sorry, if you're doing uh, 26 in, in 1990 and turned uh, 26 in 2016, there was a two-thirds chance and you're born in the bottom quartile of income, they, you would be earning less than your low-income parents. And so America has gone backwards in terms of opportunity. And if you look at the map, the deeper the red, they, uh, these are all counties, the deeper the chance that you are earning less than your low-income parents. Uh, oddly, in many ways, this is also a political map. And if you ask, and many people ask me, what's going on with America? And uh, one of the things that's going on in the United States is that in those places where uh, the, the opportunity to move forward um, is deepest, those happen to be areas with the poorest health care and the areas with the poorest uh, early childhood education, et cetera, and uh, the least affordable housing and the lack of transit system. And yet those are places in which people think that their lack of opportunity is because of immigration and other issues. And so this is giving rise to the polarization of the United States. And my sense is that cities and nations where opportunity is most equalized are then able to move beyond the issue of resentment and grudges and move to be able to deal with the other real issues societies are facing. Okay, but there are real issues, by the way, in the opportunity landscape. And one of them is that with, uh, automation and robotics and AI, that uh, there is a huge shift in threat to uh, the working landscape. This photo is a car factory. There's about three people you can see in the entire photo. Uh, another one is that our minds have been colonized by social media. The big social media companies have one goal, and that is to capture your attention and sell it to others. And this is actually quite insidious. It is a digital form of, uh, you know, capturing and selling your body to others it was called slavery. I don't know if this we can call this digital slavery, but it is an absolute uh, designed intent to capture our attention. And instead of letting it be ours for our good, 
It is to sell it to others. And the purpose is for others to sell us either material goods, which we may or may not need, to make us think we need those things, to sell us ideas, um, maybe to even sell us their own versions of uh, the truth rather than a universal version of truth. And so this is also quite insidious and, and in many ways creating increased isolation. We know it's leading to teenage uh, despair, despondency, and suicide, um, uh, and is a, is a serious issue. Uh, this comes from the uh, uh, World Economic Forum, the meeting in Davos. Every year they put out a, a list of global threats, and this is the threats they see in the next two years versus 10 years, and it's quite disturbing. So number one, they see misinformation and disinformation, extreme weather events, societal polarization, cyber insecurity, interstate armed conflict, lack of economic opportunity, inflation, involuntary migration, economic downturn and pollution as the key things that the world is being faced with now. And it only gets worse when you look at 10 years from now because they add to this biodiversity loss, natural resource shortages, et cetera. Um, outcomes of uh, adverse outcomes of AI tech, societal polarization. Um, and so one of the key things of this uh, that, that I want to talk about is within these issues, the most uh, potent uh, place of solution, I believe, is cities. Cities are places where people meet themselves, they meet face to face, they meet in communities, they live. It's a place where they're educated. It's a place where uh, that is probably the most uh, viable place to attack the issues of climate change and biodiversity loss. And so cities are absolutely not only a solution, but a deeply needed solution in these times of increased volatility and risk. And that our cities can be sanctuaries. In the United States, the idea of sanctuary cities become a political phrase because it refers to uh, migration sanctuary. But if we think of them as sanctuaries for all of their residents, um, I actually think that's a very important uh, uh, potential um, I idea. Um, so let's talk a little, just a little bit about the history of cities. This is the oldest um, development that we know. Uh, I'm sure there could be others, but it's the oldest significant thing we've excavated. It's called uh, uh, Happy. Uh, uh, it's in the. Uh, sorry. Uh, it's in uh, the southern Turkey, uh, Go Gobekli Tepe, and it's an incredible ruin of not only one temple, but a whole series of temples. So this occurred in a time when people were still hunter-gatherers, they had not settled down, they did not have agriculture, and yet they built this enormous series of places with stones that had amazing carvings in them that may have taken 500 people to carry, so it showed tremendous social organization. Um, around a spirit, and they were clearly places of worship. And uh, so the professor who discovered this said that first came the temple, then came the city. At the heart of every ancient city, we saw that it, they were created on a place of spiritual importance. Um, and the, the city grew from that. And one of my theses is that if we learn about the original emergence of cities, those are lessons for the future of cities. And my sense is that if cities can regain that sense of a spiritual connection to place and a place in which the resident feels both grounded in place but connected to the larger universe, that that will make for cities of greater well-being. As cities began to grow, they began to trade. And uh, what we saw is something in, the, in many areas uh, called an interaction zone. So this happens to be in the Middle East, but by the way, there was a whole network of cities that, simul that later, but also grew, for example, in what today we call South America, the Incas and Mayan cities, et cetera. And they all had these roads, these trade roads of interconnection. And you can see they were trading gold and silver and lapis and copper, alabaster. And this is over a distance of about 2000 miles. And we're talking about uh, at least 6,000 years ago, um, even 8,000 years ago, uh, this trade was happening. And the trade was happening because people differentiated and connected. So you, if every city had exactly the same thing, there was no reason to trade wheat for wheat or rice for rice. But we trade because 
places are differentiated, they have something else to offer, but that's a value when we interconnect to share that. And what happens across these trade routes was not only the trade of goods, but the trade of ideas. And so an improvement in one place got passed on to another and they leapfrogged. We're seeing, by the way, uh, uh, Bloomberg created a wonderful network called C40 and there are other, uh, there's the Rockefeller Foundation, 100 Resilient Cities. There are many uh, global networks now established to interconnect cities on the exchange of ideas. And these are very, very important, but the physical trade of goods is also key to cities. And this idea that civilization advances through differentiation and interconnection is also important because we're seeing a global trend where the world is repolarizing. So for example, in the South China Seas, you're seeing the polarization between the United States and China and India wants to be part of a polar, a pole too, and many other poles too, which uh, in many ways are undermining the benefits of not globalization, but specialization, and then the exchange of specialization. Uh, this is the model of the first city, which is um, Uruk. Uh, and uh, in that, there was a key philosophy, which was um, on the left of this is the god of chaos, and on the right of this is the god of order, and that healthy cities actually maintain need to maintain this balance. There need to be enough freedom and openness of opportunity uh, that was balanced with uh, a sense of order and control in place. And um, we are seeing around the world two things. We're seeing places that are overly chaotic. They've lost control. And we're seeing places that are becoming overly rigid. And so, for example, the clampdowns in Hong Kong are definitely going to re reduce its creativity. And um, uh, as Hong Kong has become more of a vassal city of China, it becomes less of a city of, of transformation for the world. Um, does not mean the country should not be able to control their cities well, we understand that, but um, this balance between the, the openness and, and the openness of ideas and expression, the openness of opportunity and control needs to be balanced. And it's something, by the way, that I think um, Singapore has long been very conscious about. Some cities are unconscious about it. Singapore has been very conscious about how it approaches uh, this balance. Um, this is Hammurabi, and Hammurabi said, so Hammurabi, the code of Hammurabi came out in 1732 in BC or something like that. And in this, he said, I am the uh, the, the god of um, the great the, the salvation bearing shepherd over my city, that my people should repose in peace, that the strong don't injure the weak. I'm here to protect the widows and orphans, to bespeak justice in the land, to settle all disputes and injuries. I shall rule to further the well-being of mankind. So there was a real moral and ethical uh, purpose to his leadership. And, um, and that was very early in the founding of cities. This language sounds biblical. It actually precedes the Bible by a thousand years, really the codification of the Bible by a thousand, the Old Testament by, the, oh, by a thousand years. And so you can see these ideas of justice um, and equality and protection are very rooted in the idea of the legal codes and the social codes, the moral codes of cities. So again, these two are very important elements um, that I think need to be taken forward. I'm now going to jump. So this is the 1960s, and this is a an affordable housing development in um, uh, St. Louis uh, in, in the United States. Uh, called Pruitt Igo. It was a really bad idea. We uh, took old neighborhoods and uh, that, by the way, at that time had inadequate housing. A lot of the housing was in very poor condition. It was historic, it may not have even had bathrooms inside. We tore it down. We built these enormous blocks of repetitive monoculture of housing. So we know that from nature, we really need diverse cultures that monocultures die. Um, and uh, this was such a bad place that it actually got blown up. And TV, we all, like many of us in the 70s, uh, saw this, uh, it actually being destroyed on TV. By the way, the architect of this also went on to become the architect of the World Trade Center. So he's the only architect I know who had um, 
uh, two of his most important projects blown up on uh, uh, national TV. Not a great distinction, but anyway, this project um, did not work well. So what do cities need? I've mentioned several things. I've talked about diversity. I've talked about interconnection. I've talked about actually having a spiritual basis, a vision, more morality and ethics. I've put the, 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 design, the design and management of city into five buckets, and that's what I'm going to now talk about. Coherence, circularity, resilience, community, and compassion. And um, these are key sections. They're all described in my book. Um, so I wanted to talk first about uh, coherence. Uh, so there's an, a, a Nobel Prize winning chemist, Ilya Prigonin, who said, when a complex system is far from equilibrium, small islands of coherence in a sea of chaos have the capacity to shift the entire system to a higher order. Okay, so if you look at the information that I gave you from the Davos uh, World Economic Forum, it sure seems like there is a growing sea of chaos out there. And yet cities can be those islands of coherence, particularly Singapore, which is an island of coherence in the sea of chaos. And they have the ability to shift the entire system to a higher order. Think, by the way, about water, which has a lot of molecules that are all going around. As you bring water towards 32 degrees, you begin to get crystals. And then all of a sudden, the crystals create an order, and boom, the whole thing is like organized into ice. Now, we don't want uh, order that's frozen like ice, but um, our, I believe that our goal is to create cities as islands of coherence, and those are amazing leverage points to this larger sea of chaos. Um, part of this order starts with city design, and China has had a long history of not only a beautiful order in, in the nine uh, square system, but in, in city, in building design and in city design and a sense of how coherence is created in cities. Uh, this happens to be Angkor Wat. So we see this as a Asian and Southeast Asian tradition, particularly there's a long sense of, of, of orderly place design. Um, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about Bhutan because one of the interesting things that happened was in 19, uh, I first went to Bhutan in 2000, I'm sorry, 1982, but I returned in 19, in 2017, and I had a copy of my book with me, which I wanted to give to His Majesty the King, but the King wasn't there. He was in one of his favorite places, Singapore, and when he was in Singapore, he went into a bookstore, and he found a book on cities, which happened to be my book, and he bought it, and he liked it so much, he called his secretary. Oh, so meanwhile, when I was in Bhutan, I gave a copy of my book to a guy who said he could get it to the King. So the king from Singapore called the secretary and said, I found this book. I really want to find this uh, writer to help me with my cities. And the secretary said, that's funny. The writer is in Singapore, in, uh, in Timpu, which is the capital of Bhutan, looking for you. So to make a long story short, I've been advising the government of Bhutan on the master plan for its city. So as I talk to you about some of the, and uh, uh, Timpu is, as you can see, is uh, high in the Himalayas. Uh, uh, above Bangladesh and above India, um, and uh, to the east of Nepal. So as I talk to you about cities, I'm going to give you some examples, not only from uh, Singapore and from uh, New York and other cities around the world, but also a South Asian small developing city, which is Timpu. Um, this is Timpu in 2000. Three, uh, as I said, the capital of Bhutan, and this is the uh, city 20 years later, 2023. And what happened between this and this was there was a new master plan that unleashed private development, but failed to also think about the public development. So cities are a balance between the private good and the public good. And the public good is seen through not only water and sewer systems and great schools, parks, transit systems, there's a whole series of communal infrastructure. Much of it is physical. Some of it is, is actually conceptual. It's the sense of who we are as a city. And this became very much out of balance in Timbu. So you have a lot of buildings that are in many ways disorderly. And uh, the key part of the plan is now to bring the public and the private back in balance. The 
the individual good and the common good back together. And we've set these following goals for the Timpu plan, and they really make sense today for all cities. So the first is green and resilient urbanization. Uh, one of the things you'll see that people most want is to have contact with nature, to bring nature back into their cities. And uh, Singapore is doing a great job of that, of, of creating urban parks and connecting people in a green way. We also need green buildings, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. We need to conserve natural capital. We need uh, to deal with the energy transition. Uh, climate change is real, it's serious, it has many, many effects, and only some of them are about rising sea levels and rising heat. We're gonna see uh, the depletion of um, many food types and, uh, and we're, we're the increase in disease transmission. There are many, many negative effects. We need to move on with a non-fossil fuel energy transition as soon as possible. We need to absorb carbon. So we not only need to stop putting out carbon, we need to absorb carbon. We need water and food security. And I featured in my book, by the way, the, the amazing work that Singapore has been doing to become water independent from Malaysia. Um, and we need to do this all in a, in a way of community engagement. It begins with planning. And we really deeply believe in community-based planning where, uh, and that those plans then can sum up into larger physical plans. This happens, and then the plan needs to be made really coherent and clear to the community. So there was a, a plan that the Portland Sustainability Institute did in Portland in 2003. So back at the same time that Bhutan was entering into chaotic plan, Portland, Oregon in the United States, a mid-sized city, did a plan, and their goal was that they would have green buildings and that are higher density. So the building you see in the center for Portland was a taller than normal building. And um, you see it has solar on the side and windmills on the roof, neither of which worked, but it was to indicate green building. Uh, that it had a range of transportation systems, bicycle, people walking, a bus, a, a, the greenest car, which was the Prius back then, and uh, light rail. Uh, it had a park on the left, so people were connected to nature. You saw trees on the streets. You see the food says Oregon grown. You see a little child, so it's saying that this is a city that's great for families. Um, and so they created an image. And actually, when you think about Portland, Portland very much aspires to this image. These are all things. They have been a leader in alternative transit. They have focused on bringing families back into the city. They are working on connecting the city more with nature. And so... It's not just having a plan, but it's having a plan that the people of the city understand and embody. Uh, this is a vision for the future of London. And what's interesting is now, as you begin to look at these city plans, they all have a super green mass transit system, which you see in the center. They all have, if you look on the left, there are windmills, some form of green, there are windmills all throughout green energy. They see how many, how many trees there are. They all have this desire to connect with nature. And many of them have, if you look in the air, you see helicopters, little flying things are, uh, in, in the air. But um, there's a real global sense of an aspiration for higher density with greater green, interconnected with better transit systems um, and doing it in a way that's environmentally responsible. We also need to measure our progress. So in uh, Bhutan, we put together um, their gross national happiness system, which they call GNH, which are these nine sectors, psychological well-being, health, education, time use, community vitality, et cetera, uh, with a uh, wonderful idea um, that has emerged uh, out of England called by Kate Raw, it's called Donut Economics, which says that we need to provide everybody with a social foundation, housing, gender equality, social equity, political voice, the things that make for a decent society, but we have to do that within the limits of climate change and biodiversity loss and freshwater loss, et cetera. So we have to have sufficient social support. We need to design an economy that provides sufficient social support, but limits our ecological impact. And so we put these together like this. <clears throat> and a key idea that emerges is that you need an economy that is regenerative and distributive. This is another measurement system um, uh, for those came up in Santa Monica, also in the early 2000s. Um, 
And these are called community health indicators. And you can hold many community meetings and ask people what really matters to them. And one of the great things is you do not have to negotiate. You don't have to say, well, we only have 10 standards and which are they gonna be? You can have hundreds of them. So in this, for example, there's a matter of bicycle lanes and uh, uh, eliminating income disparity, reducing water use, reducing energy use, reducing greenhouse gases, the amount of open space, participation in civic affairs, volunteering, the degree that students are doing well in school. All of these were indicators that people said they wanted to know what was how their city was doing. And you can measure all these and we can even measure them in relatively real time. And we can report on them to our residents, number one. But number two, we can map them and see how well we're doing. So one of the things we tend to do with city plans is we go through this whole complicated process. We make a city plan, it takes years to make, we approve it, and then it's the plan for 20 years. And yet, we actually need to be adjusting the plan. And the plan is not only a physical plan, it's an economic plan, it's a social plan, it's an allocation plan of resources among city agencies. And my view is that in real-time feedback, if we have community health indicators, we should be making reallocations, at least annually, to make sure that we're optimizing, not maximizing, but optimizing amongst all these different goals. And we can see where we are in real time, and we can be adjusting how we are running our city uh, to get there. Uh, this is another thing, so a system called Urban Footprint, um, uh, which is a way of future casting. So we can actually forecast, we can actually scenario planning, we can actually uh, look at where we are with the city, we can look at trends, what are our population trends, what are our economic trends, our, our income inequality trends, and we can project where we're going. Then we can model different alternative futures and see what different outcomes they come up with. And this can help this future casting and scenario planning can really help us um, in those adjustments that I'm talking about that I think much more dynamic city uh, management could be delivering. The next thing is that we need to be a more circular economy. And one of the key visions of circularity, by the way, is the water system of Singapore. Um, which you have really said, because we wanna stop importing water from Malaysia if we can, we're gonna recycle water, we're gonna use water more carefully. We need to be not only recycling water, but also heat, <clears throat> organic waste, solid waste, construction materials, et cetera. Um, this is the waste treatment plant at Windhoek, which is a small city in Namibia in South Africa. And as Namibia was growing, it's in a desert and it was running out of water. And so they developed a system in which they, we, the first system in the world in which they took their wastewater and they cleaned it up and they put it back into their drinking water. They have never had an accident. The engineer who designed this said, we need to judge water by its quality and not by its history. And the city has been able to grow wonderfully because of this circularity. Uh, there's so many things that we can be recycling within our cities is a metabolism of cities. In many cases, 95% of what comes into a city leaves the city as waste. And the more that it can circulate and that we can think of lower waste cities and higher circularity cities, the more resilient they will be. And again, remember the World Economic Forum, threats to resilience are coming. We need to think about, and, and about internal resilience. This is the waste treatment plant outside of Washington, D.C in which they take out of the waste um, the nutrients of nitrogen and phosphates, and they turn those into um, fertilizer, which they then sell, and they actually sell it at a profit. They're also taking um, the methane that comes off the plant and turning that back into energy. And so if we begin to think of our waste systems as also generative systems, as factory systems, um, that would be very helpful. Um, in Bhutan, we came up with this idea of this green building, a new resilient uh, way of building. The contemporary buildings are built out of concrete and rebar. They're mediocre buildings. They're built by cheap Indian labor. Um, and there are about 40,000 dull, what we call dull, dangerous construction jobs of imported labor and material. And the goal is, could we turn these into 10,000 much healthier, dignified, high-tech jobs that are actually um, 
all Bhutanese jobs and then actually create this circular system within the country. And the vision is, we're seeing the wonderful growth of mass timber and the creating of CLT and other timber products. And Bhutan has wonderful forests. If you sustainably harvest the forest, can you then turn those in factories into higher tech building components, into panels and beams, et cetera, and then assemble buildings in a much more high tech way, which uses about a quarter of the labor, but it's a much more technically informed and competent labor and therefore much more higher, high paying. So can we create 10,000 local jobs using import, lo locally generated materials, also using ram dirt, and, uh, which is a traditional way of building in Bhutan and making much higher quality buildings. We have done a model for this is how the pieces would fit together. And this is a Bhutanese style architecture, but uh, a proposal for what a contemporary uh, mass timber Bhutanese building uh, could look like. Um, so this regenerative source of construction is essential. Uh, this is a building that our company built called Via Verde uh, in uh, the Bronx as a model of affordable housing in 2011. Um, it is built, by the way, it was out of prefab panels. These are highly insulated panels. You'll see that there's solar on the roof. It uses a lot of passive techniques such as shading. Um, it has a series of interior courtyards and gardens uh, that create red balanced private space and, and uh, communal spaces. Uh, children's play area has its own an orchard that grows apples and pears, has community gardens. It recycles uh, the organic waste of the building into compost, which we then use for the gardens. And the thing on the right-hand side, it takes actually rainwater and purifies it and, and uses that for the garden water and laundry water. We deeply believe in, in health and creating healthy communities, which means providing exercise rooms and affordable housing. If there was an exercise room in the past, it would have been in the basement. In this case, it's up with it, surrounded by gardens and daylight lighting, which attracts people to use it. Um, this is a, a, a building that was built in um, Seattle. It's one of the first super green office buildings. That large hat on its roof is a solar system that creates all the energy the building needs. So I want to talk about now the idea of circularity within cities and in which we begin to create these loops in which are the microgrids in which we're not only having utility power, which you need, but if every building had photovoltaic, uh, if we had uh, wind generation batteries um, or storage systems, uh, and in, in, think about three loops. So if there is a, um, an energy loop, a heat loop, so for example, there's a system in Minneapolis in the United States where the waste heat that's coming out of um, actually a hospital system is being connected. I'm sorry, the waste heat that's coming out of a grocery store. So think in grocery stores, there those in lines of uh, refrigerators and freezers, those are taking out heat. And if that heat could then get recycled to heat the water for hospitals, which use an enormous amount of heat and water. So you're tying them together. So the more we can control, connect heat systems, energy systems, and information systems, we can create that circularity. Um, as I said, I think that Singapore is really a fantastic model of bringing nature back into cities and trying to connect with mass transit and reduce the use of cars, increase the use of walkability and transit to increase mixes of uses and mixes of, of income. Um, we need to make our cities more resilient. This is a plan for New York City that's actually being built now, which is the idea of creating an integrated park system all around the tip of Manhattan that also is raised and becomes a berm system to help uh, reduce storm surge. I now want to talk about the idea of social connectivity and resilience, really creating compassionate communities that are designed specifically to solve this issue of the poor distribution of opportunity. Okay, so this is a, 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 this describes some of the key elements that make equal landscapes of opportunity. They begin with affordable housing. Ron Terwilliger, who was chair of the board of the Urban Land Institute at one point says, uh, you uh, can't do homework if you're living under a bridge. We need safe, secure, green, affordable housing. We need education, 
We need access to equal health care, access to open space, neighborhood serving markets with local food, livelihood is jobs, arts and culture um, is not only for the it's, uh, we treat arts and culture these days almost like as it's a, it's a nice surplus to society, but actually it's an essential core of who we are and, and our and our mythologies teach us both to be aspirational but carry with us their moralities. Um, access and transit and spirituality, as I said, they are great cities all began, many of them began uh, with temples or spiritual um, grounding places in their very core. And uh, in many ways, our cities are devoid of that today. And we think it's really important to bring that back. So what does that look like on the ground? And again, we can measure all these things, hey, how we're doing well or not. And we can uh, we can work dynamically to improve how we're doing. So one of the things our company does is we have investment funds that buy existing affordable housing. We make it green and we bring social health and education programs to our residents. So we make it green by insulation and air sealing, putting in high performance windows, integrated pest management to reduce toxicity, tuning our boilers, replacing them with fossil fuel free boilers, healthy materials, uh, low flow uh, faucets, aerators, shower heads, et cetera. What's interesting about this from an environmental point of view is what it means is that every time we buy an existing building and we improve its energy performance, that we use more biologically based materials, we use greener materials, et cetera, we're actually reducing environmental impacts on the earth. At the same time, we build in these buildings, we do this in all our new developments, but at a much larger scale in all the existing buildings we're building, a community room, uh, we connect our residents to outdoor green space and community gardens. We have communication systems. We have a fitness room, a computer lab, a medical screening room, so we can actually connect our residents. We bring healthcare on site and then connect our residents with the healthcare on site. Same thing with social service rooms. We have libraries, after school programs that are run in the computer rooms and classrooms, et cetera. So we are specifically taking our funds by existing affordable and mixed income housing, and we are turning them into the landscapes of opportunity that I've described. So we need to bring those to neighborhoods, but we can actually bring all those elements that I showed you in that original chart. We can bring them to buildings themselves and make them as, uh, as those both islands of coherence and landscapes of opportunity. And this is what it looks like. This is a Suburban building, typically we're buying more built for urban buildings, but where we put solar on the roof and we built, there were a thousand people living in this site with no community facility. We built a $2 million community hall. This is a health exam room, which means all of a sudden hundreds of people can be seen in a, in a week uh, on site. Uh, um, with, for example, if you have to go to a doctor who takes care of the kids when, when the parents are out or it just makes it much more easy to get health care uh, as we have our doctors not only prescribing medicine, but provides it prescribing exercise, which is why we need fitness facilities on site. We bring healthy food to our residents, connecting with food banks and mobile groceries. We have community gardens. English is second language. We encourage all of our residents to vote um, because we need to strengthen democracy. We provide cultural programs that are also exercise programs, after school programs for kids, uh, arts and culture, socialization, um, meditation, and uh, um, because we are living in this very chaotic world and actually the deeper we can disconnect at some points and connect with a sense of higher purpose, a sense of morality, a sense of the understanding of our interdependent role in the world, the better. And so I want to end with, so what is all this work about? To me, it's really about making wholeness. Christopher Alexander, architect at Berkeley University said, making wholeness heals the maker. It is my sense that that is our job in the world as urbanists, which is to make wholeness in islands of coherence. So thank you. We're now going to go to a discussion and I look forward to many of your questions too. Jonathan, thank you. thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Rose, for that very inspiring and beautiful lecture. I would now like to introduce the moderator for the evening. 
Uh, Mr. Anupam Yog is a pragmatic urbanist, researcher, and creative strategist. Through his research and advocacy for, on placemaking for healthy cities, he seeks to develop a conscious cities index, which explores the connection between community well-being and a city's urban design. Mr. Yog is an avid practitioner of meditation and initiated the Big Sit in 2020, a social meditation movement that reimagines the relationship between people and place. We now invite the audience to please raise their questions via the portal. Over to you, Mr. Yog. Thank you, Sanjana, and, and thank you so much, Jonathan. I should actually call you Professor Rose. Uh, that was a wonderful, insightful uh, lecture on a book that is one of my favorite books. I have it in front of me now, and I thought we could perhaps kick off our discussion today. Um, and by the way, I have the well-tempered clavier playing in the background, so <laughs> it's uh, it's it's really a delight to be here. So I wanted to read out a passage from your book in the in the chapter called Entwinement, and uh, it goes like this. Jonathan Sebastian Bach wrote the second book of the Well-Tempered Clavier in 1742 when Europe was undergoing an enormous cultural transition from the Reformation to the Age of Enlightenment. The Enlightenment unleashed scientific rationalism, releasing Europe from centuries of religious dogma. This new thinking gave rise to the American and French revolutions and to the Industrial Revolution. The sacred and the secular began to diverge. Philosophy and science shifted attention from the cosmos to the individual, from the holy to the human, from the complex to the complicated. But Bach never wavered, and his greatest works resonate with us to this day because they integrate harmonic genius with a deep spiritual aspiration, qualities that were separated in the Enlightenment. So that is a, a very insightful paragraph. And I wanted to ask you, what do you think... Um, which age are we in? Are we undergoing some kind of transition? You referred to how maybe things can go backward and not just forward. So I'm I'm curious to, to learn about your perspective on what kind of age do you think we live in right now? So we are definitely in an age of transition. And I do see the emergence of backwards and forwards. So by the way, the work that you're doing in creating more uh, conscious cities, by the way, is, is fantastic work and is emblematic of the forward. And we are, there's a initiative in the United States called Mindful Cities. We're seeing uh, the lessons of quantum mechanics. Okay, so this is, so uh, if we say that we're moving into an age of relativity and quantum, so uh, just to, to frame this a little bit, um, you know, when I first heard about quantum mechanics, I thought it was all about particles and the subparticles. So it was about the increased atomization of the world. But what we really learned from quantum is the same thing we learned from ecology, that everything is deeply interdependent, that everything is co-arising, co-creating, that, um, and the, the uncertainty of quantum mechanics is not because we can't measure things, it's because nothing is fixed. What quantum mechanics has actually come to see is that everything is in constant dynamic function. It is in constantly interacting with everything else that it is co-arising continuously, just the way in ecology, every little bit is influencing every little bit in an ecosystem. So this age of, this brings us to an, what I would call an age of relationality where we understand that the true nature of the world is relational. And that we then, uh, if we can merge that understanding, and one of the great things about your work in trying to bring more meditation to cities is that as we begin to dissolve our, our, our fixed sense of self, we, we unleash in the mind the capacity to think more relationally. And that worldview and mindset is really essential for us then to design more relational systems. When relational systems are imbued with morality, then what we get is this compounding um, coherence. We actually, because if you understand how everything's interconnected and you feed in that interconnection, a view of compassion, what you get then is systems of mutuality, systems that are much more resilient, 
Um, you'll see, by the way, in almost all the world's indigenous systems, there were systems of mutuality and reciprocity. Reciprocity was really, really key. You know, like do unto others as you would have them do unto you is 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 a foundational principle in every moral and religious system in the world. And we have moved, one of the outcomes of enlightenment was we moved in a highly materialistic culture, which is very much about atomization, about my house, my land, my property, my company, my income, my, 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 my. So we are, we have created a world in which we think security is about building the bounds of self and yet the true security which we see in resilience at times of threat which we see in ecological systems and as i said also in quantum systems is all their interconnection and therefore if we can really embody this this knowledge so i'm going to say one more thing which is that um which I, i've been implying but haven't said clearly that often the age and the ethos of the age is embodied in the scientific understanding of that age. So the enlightenment was certainly advanced by the work of Newton. And I'm suggesting that our new age, this relational age that's going to emerge, is the outcome of Einstein's relativity, of Heisenberg's quantum mechanics, and of all the lessons of ecology that we have had. And if we can take that scientific knowledge and embody it in a worldview, imbue it with morality, then we will enter a fantastic age of mutuality or relationality. And I am calling this the age of the common good. Thank you. That is a very interesting frame. And uh, I'm curious when you, when you think about relationality and for relationality to result in mutuality, and reciprocity as it was. Um, I go back to the beginning of your presentation and one of those threats you talked about, about how our minds are being colonized, uh, digital slavery and you know the, the capacity to observe is perhaps getting diminished. And if we stop to observe, perhaps we um, incite more reaction. So if the age of relationality, I, I would say is also sort of synonymous with the age of observation and the age of non-reactivity, uh, more tolerance, capacity to uh, grow uh, would be a very different form of urban development. Um, I'm, I'm curious about how you, how you feel uh, about you know, less intellectualization of planning and more intuition in planning. You're doing some fantastic work in Timpu. Thank you for sharing that. But I was curious also about this this think versus feel, how do we balance? You talked about regaining balance. So how do we actually find balance, regain balance? Uh, is, do you think there's too much over-intellectualization and is there a need for more intuition and balance between those two? It's a very good question. Actually, I feel like there needs to be more intellectualization that, um, that somehow, that in many ways, some cities have become very bureaucratic or they have become very... Um, they become ignorant to their so versus intellectualization. So I, I am a big advocate for city intelligence. And we have described this as smart cities, but smart cities, to be honest, have really become just mechanisms for big companies to sell us uh, fancy software and a lot of automation. Whereas what I'm really describing is for a community base. So this gets to your feeling and and compassion, which is if we can really hear what people's needs are and we can translate those needs into, into processes and outcomes. So the other thing that I'm describing is a deep integration, but what I call hardware and software. So just as a computer, we co-evolves between the, the chips and the physical stuff within the memory of the computer, but also the software and each one enables each other. So the physicality of the city and the information systems should, in a more dynamic way, let the city evolve to meet the true human needs. And there are base human needs and there are higher human needs. So by the way, I'm just going to give a little example of this. We won this, the green project, which I showed you, all our buildings are very green, but called Via Verde, through a design competition. And in that competition, all the competitors were not allowed to speak to the community, but we got to hear the community. 
we all attended a community meeting and in the community meeting, it was in the South Bronx and in the night, and a guy stands up and he says, I want a jacuzzi. That's what I really wanted in an ideal apartment. And everybody laughed and they kind of made fun of the guy. But what I heard him say was, I want to be treated with respect. I want to be proud of my apartment. And I view a jacuzzi as a tool of health and I want to be a healthy environment. So we took that idea and we translated into those things of a building of beauty that shows respect for the residents of health and all that stuff. So, and we won the competition. So there is a kind of, so this has to do with your intellectual versus feeling. There is a kind of listening that requires intelligence, but listens through to try and get to the essence of human need and human aspiration. We also, by the way, need to get to the essence of um, the non-human species because we really thrive in a deeply biologically rich world. And as our world becomes a monoculture, as we begin to lose biodiversity, uh, it's, it's, it's the destruction of a sacred gift, but it's also destabilizing the world. It's a, it will be a, a deep uh, harm to human life too. But, so from both a selfish and a non-selfish thing. So we need to actually be able to listen to all of life, not just with our minds, but with our hearts to understand what its true intention is, and then to try and collectively design for that the emergence of the best well-being. Thank you. That is uh, very insightful. And I think capacity to listen is is so crucial, but to interpret it in the way that's a beautiful story that 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 will remain with me for for some time. And I'm sure to be bringing it up in projects that I'm involved in. I, I you you mentioned compassion, and that is certainly uh, one of the five pillars on which your book is developed. I, in Singapore, we we have a brand called Passion Made Possible, and uh, members of the community have uh, taken that to the next level and uh, explored compassion made possible. So you talked a little bit about the big sit and social meditation, and you certainly talked about meditation. And I'm going to weave the question in because I'm, I'm also receiving questions from the audience, and I want to bring them in right away. Um, there's a question on how can Singapore continue to improve? What is the next level to which we can aspire to? So I thought I'd share that, but I also wanted to get some some thoughts on you on the connection between compassion and city making. So the connection on compassion and city making takes place at many levels. So the first is what is the what is the purpose of the city and what is the uh, purpose of city leadership? Um, and you happen to be a city state, but um, so, and, you know, I am proposing that the purpose of the city, first of all, is to equalize this landscape of opportunity so that every resident feel, and by the way, when people feel they have opportunity, opportunity requires security as a platform. And as far as I'm concerned, uh, Singapore has the best public housing system of any country in the world. Um, so you, uh, in many ways, by the way, si Singapore is a model, which is great because you have overcome so many of the fundamental issues that other cities have not, that allows you then with these platforms of opportunity. And NUS is an example of an extraordinary education system. So in, in Singapore, and I you know it, it, it's an elite school, so not everybody gets to go to NUS, but um uh, you also have this city has a great education system. So when you have these fundamentals, the social foundations taken care of, then you can begin to, that they are actually to me an expression of compassion. But the more we can look at the places in the city which um, where opportunity is less equalized and try and figure out how you equalize, that to me is number one. Number two, which uh, Singapore has also really begun to focus on, which is biodiversity. Um, and so uh, if we expand this landscape of opportunity to equalize it, not only for humans, but for as many species as possible, um, that would be the next level. The next one is a cultural thing. So when people feel safe, and people definitely do feel safe in Singapore, 
they can begin to expand their boundaries of, of who they think is their tribe and how big their tribe is. And as you know, Singapore had race riots in the 70s. And one of the wonderful outcomes of it is that they have a requirement that buildings are um, have mixed races uh, within them, a real sense of kind of creating an integrated sense of us as Singapore. So again, what I'm really saying is Sing there may be much more to go with Singapore as a model of compassion, but you're one of the most advanced cities in the world in terms of compassion. So as we have this sense of us-ness, of that we're all in it together, um, then to me, the next level is to look at increased levels of relationality. And interestingly, I'm going to go back to Bhutan. So in Bhutan, in the rural areas, people live in magnificent, big, beautifully designed and constructed houses, all milled, made out of local, local timber and bricks that are made from the local earth. And the way they're made is uh, by the family may hire one master carpenter and then all the community volunteers, and they cut wood from a communal forest so they don't have to buy it, and they make the materials locally, and they build these incredible houses. But the key is they own them without debt. And by owning them without debt, um, they, you know, by living with their yak herds in their community gardens, et cetera, they, they actually live very comfortable lives because uh, they don't have the burden of a chunk of their income going to pay for the ownership of their home. This is based on a mutual system. The challenge I'm asking, and I would love you know, to, to learn from, is where are there mutual systems that help us de-financialize our relationships and increase our mutuality? I'm gonna give one more example. Um, and those I think create more systems of care. So for example, in Germany, the national government gives every individual a budget of something like $300 a month um, that they can use towards care. So for example, if you're elderly, you can hire a caregiver. If you're a young parent, you can hire somebody to watch your kids. Or you can use that money to put your kids in daycare well, so you can work extra hours or whatever. So anyway, the bottom line of all this is that if we can move to a more caring society and think of systems of care, which are not only based on money, but based on mutuality and exchange, I think that helps not only grow a more compassionate city, but it gives people more economic resilience if it can help de-financialize the relationships a little bit. Yeah, this takes me to another part of your book in the same chapter where you talk about the fitness of the city. And I'll just read out the, the opening sentence. It says, Kenneth Burke, one of the most important American literary theorists of the 20th century, wrote that people may be unfitted by being fit in an unfit fitness. So it, it took me a moment to digest that. But I think your, your point about how we are in an unfit fitness and we need to get to a state of fit fitness or unfit fitness. Um, it's a bit of a mouthful, but I I am curious about your view on obviously cities and are part of systems that are national and federal and state. And there, there are many interesting things that are driving, you know, a state of being. And uh, I'm, I'm curious about how you feel um, we can get out of these paradigms that are there's inertia in built into systems. Um, it's it's sometimes just very hard to get out of a state of what you call uh, unfit fitness because you know why change? Uh, it's all good. Okay, so by the way, this is going to tie into one of the questions, which was um, should the architecture and design of cities focus on enriching the psychological experience and relationship of users? I've been talking about that. But so when we have cities, like you, like certainly in the United States, there are parts of cities where we go to where we are uncomfortable, where we feel dangerous or they're dirty or they're, and this is, so think of that as the unfitness. And if you're raised and grow up in that, and you've had to psychologically adapt to those disruptive, ugly, discordant places, then you are, you've made yourself fit into something that's unfit. Okay, so what we really want to do is create cities that 
in, in, by their physical nature, their operational nature, their cultural nature, are all designed to enhance psychological well-being. Now, the good news is, number one, we all have built-in meters uh, where we can all sense whether we're moving towards well-being or away from well-being. You know, we know when we're more relaxed or we're more tense. We know when we're happier or less happy. We know when we're healthier or less healthy. Um, and uh, and certainly people aspire to one of the reasons one of the ways people decide on where to go on vacation they go on vacation places that stimulate them sometimes but a lot of people go on vacation to places where they're just gonna feel better so we know what it feels like and so um, and why would you want to design a culture that makes people feel less happy less well uh, more disrupted more uncertain. So I actually, so you're right, there is um, entropy, there's resistance that's built into our existing systems. Um, but I think if we can politically express and culturally express this desire to be happier, to be more well, and then to, um, and to put out examples of how we create more well-being, we can create movements that not only aspire to more well-being, but that uh, respond positively. You know, that like, like we elect people when they deliver it. And we've seen, by the way, a lot of mayors, certainly in the United States and around the world, think of Anne Hidalgo, who's the mayor of Paris, as she delivers more 15-minute city, more parks. You know, the, the uh, Jaime Lerner in Curitiba's as we think of the great mayors around the world, as they deliver increased well-being to their residents, they get rewarded by increased re-election. So I, I want to shift the discussion a bit on that. You, you talked about mayors and individuals. Um, what about the private sector and the real estate development community? You, you've been a developer and you know that better than most. And I, I, I just want to try and understand what's the role to get out of this, you know, fitted. Because there, as we know, there is a lot of inertia in the built environment. We're both part of the Urban Land Institute. And I know what our mission is to try and create communities uh, for a sustainable future. I, I'm, I'm really curious about what your perspective is and message is for the built community, particularly developers who, who harness all of this energy and, and try and create things which take time. It's it's not easy to get anything built. Um, so what do you think is the role? Do, do they need to be pushing for that change politically as well as, you know, obviously the things that they're designing and building for people? So the great thing about the Urban Land Institute is it is not only an organization of developers, it's an organization of lenders and investors, but also of city planners and city, uh, city leaders. And um, I have seen the Urban Land Institute shift enormously over the years. I became a member in the 1970s, in which I was advocating for green buildings and was completely thought to be ridiculous for that. I mean, that it was completely antithetical to the industry. And now you'll see the Urban Land Institute deeply advocating for, for green buildings. Uh, developers are creators. And uh, there's enormous creative capacity within developers. And, but we also, one of my phrases is form follows finance. So we can only build what we can get financed. And we can only build what we can get zoning and building department approval for. So uh, in many ways, developers' creativity needs to be unleashed and, and um, incentivized. I'll give you an example. Um, uh, I helped with an amazing national organization called Enterprise Green, uh, Community Partners create a green standard for uh, affordable housing. Back in the early 2000s, LEED was really designed for office buildings and Briam for office buildings. We didn't really have a good code for uh, multifamily housing and definitely nothing to guide the development of affordable housing. So, um, and the affordable housing industry was very ungreen. As I said, form follows finance, enterprise designed this fantastic green guideline, like a lead guideline or a well guideline. And then they um, uh, got the agencies that allocated 
money to build affordable housing, since all affordable housing is subsidized, to encourage to add like you know you you compete you get points for and the one with the most points wins the subsidies and they added green points so all of a sudden we reset the playing field from tele develop instead of telling developers whoever can build the most number of units for the least dollars per unit that used to be the old philosophy so you got a lot of cheap ugly affordable housing once we started putting in points for design excellence and points for greenness. So we changed the incentive system and then developers responded. And now some of the most creative architecture in America is with affordable housing and some of the greenest buildings, many of the greenest buildings being built are being built in affordable housing. Not because, because the incentive systems have said, here's what we want to fund. Now you go figure out how best to do it. And yes, there are guidelines like minimum guidelines, like energy, energy use guidelines and increasingly fossil fuel free guidelines, et cetera. But it, this has really unleashed developer creativity. So the more we can create the right signals the right con and the right conditions for the private sector to, to uh, create, uh, the private sector will create amazing things. Like actually, that's I'll stay on that because we have a question which I think is uh, complementary to what we're talking about. Uh, I just read it out. What are some of your ideas about the policy measures and ways to nudge Singapore's construction industry away from cheaper migrant labor and concrete to high tech sustainable materials in a circular economy, but for high rise of 30 to 50 stories? So a few things in there. Right. OK. So this is a, so first of all, the cost to use higher value local labor versus cheap imported labor will raise construction costs. Absolutely. And to me, ultimately, it's a, it's a ethical question that every city has to ask. Um, you know, the pyramids are amazing buildings, but they can only afford to build them because they use slave labor. And much of Rome was built with slave labor. And we have to decide, is it just the physical outcome that we are aspiring towards, or is it the benefit to all of society that we're aspiring towards? Um, and uh, you know, New York City is an amazing city with a lot of amazing buildings. And uh, by and I'm sure there's a little bit of forced labor within the construction market, but by and large, is built with very well-paid um, uh, labor. The typical affordable housing project in New York, I was just told that the uh, average uh, wage rate is about $80 an hour now. So um, it will raise building costs to say that we're going to pay fair wages and provide proper health facilities, et cetera. And then uh, one of the reasons why we use imported labor is because often in more developed societies, our young people don't want to go into the construction trades. So our view is that as we um, create more factory built components and the on-site work is about assembly. So I visited you know, sites where, for example, we're doing mass timber construction with beautifully made wood components that are coming out of factories. Um, the work is much more technical. It's much more it's much higher skilled, therefore it's higher paid, but there can be literally three people on a site, plus a crane operator who are actually assembling a floor. So you're using higher paid, more technically trained, technically skilled people who are, uh, I think therefore have a job which they view as a higher respect level job. There are fewer laborers on site, uh, but they can all be local. Um, Thank you. Actually, that's that's super interesting because um, I'm working on a project in Jaipur in India, where it's a greenfield project, and you know Jaipur is 300 years old, and there's some amazing craft coming out of uh, you know you talk about rammed earth and stone, and so there's this amazing opportunity, and and um, this is a a dilemma that you have to kind of think very early on in the life cycle of the project that you're going to make this choice, which is quite quite different and I think it 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 does require an ecosystem uh shift 
to a to a state where you you raise the level of even the perception of you know labor labor is is same labor can be perceived as artisans and the same artisans can then be perceived as artists so i think we need to perhaps consider bringing respect back uh, since you have touched on the ethical dimension because there is so much opportunity when you start reframing the same task as perhaps particularly in the age, age of ai and technology the focus on craft perhaps back into some of these trades so that they become more respectful and people want to practice them and by the way everything that i described before you just spoke was about technical and fitting together and automation and and but you have brought up the beautiful idea of craft. So by the way, in Bhutan, when a building is not finished until it's painted and is painted with sacred symbols and symbols of austerity and prosperity, et cetera, on the outside. And um, there is uh, um, a craftless, artisanless world is a sterile world. And um, there is something Beautiful. Remember, I ended the talk with this phrase, making wholeness feels the maker. In many ways, the artisans are our wholeness makers. And the more we can value them and build their work into buildings, the better. Yes, yes. There's there's something very inspirational about creating. And I think that's where when communities come together to make something, there's just so much more ownership about those places. And they, they get that sense of place and so on. I, I'd invite the audience. We still have over 100 people in the room, so I'd still invite the audience to ask any questions. We're down to the last uh, eight or nine minutes. I did want to ask you a, a couple of things, maybe away from, uh, you know, the book and about the author, perhaps. So if that's OK, uh, I was just curious, uh, how are you spending your time uh, these days? Are you building things? Are you giving talks? Uh, what's keeping you busy? And are you traveling to Asia anytime soon? Uh, what's happening? Great, thank you. So first of all, uh, when I started my company, it was a two-person company, and now we're 540 people. And so <laughs> it's putting a lot of time into both thinking about the growth of the company. Um, part of the way we grow is through the raising of investment funds. So I, I and others focus on our network, on our next fund. But we also... Um, and the proper investment of that work. So capital formation is an essential part of a company's growth. Um, I'm also really working on the transition because uh, I think our company is a high mission focused company and I'd like it to continue. And um, as you can see, my beard is gray and I'm getting older and we have an amazing generation of, of, of I was gonna say rising leaders, but they've risen already of leaders. And so empowering the next generation of leaders to uh, to take the firm into its future is, is, a, is a key task for me right now. And we have some really wonderful new projects in many ways. I'm the design director of our company and also the chair of investment committee. And so I'm very enthusiastic about several of the new projects. I am writing my next book. Uh, and that is uh, about this idea of the common good and this deep relationality that we've been talking about. It's got a couple more years to go because I'm so busy with other things. Um, uh, I have become this volunteer uh, advisor to the, the country of Bhutan on his urban planning. And I do come to Asia several times a year, particularly to go to Bhutan. Um, uh, I meet with uh, Bhutan very often by Zoom, but I physically I was, I was there, for example, last uh, December. Um, uh, I have a fantastic partner in this urban planning work, which is an urban designer from London, a guy also named Jonathan Rose. Uh, I try and find time to, I meditate every day and to keep growing my spiritual practice. And the last thing is that I play in a band. And our band plays we have a conjunction of Indian raga, American blues, and American jazz. And um, we are next playing at the Metropolitan wow. Museum of Art in New York City. And uh, yeah, uh, so we're in a series of rehearsals now. And it's uh, deeply satisfying to make this spiritually based but enthusiastic uh, music. Well, how wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. I, you've raised you know, you talked about meditation and music and we were on uh, both begin with M and it took me back to, uh, uh, you know, the 3M uh, 
analogy that was used by the director of the Santa Fe Institute, which I know you thanked in your acknowledgments page. And I, I was curious about, uh, have you have you done much work in Santa Fe? It's a city I visited recently, a town I visited recently, and I really enjoyed it because it's so creative and interesting. But he talked about the three M's as the mountain, the monastery, and the metropolis. And that's what the Santa Fe Institute, and, and some of your work really sounds like you 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 were probably on a mountain or in a monastery when you wrote it uh, and listening to some music, but I, I was just uh, curious about your you know views on on values of institutes like the Santa Fe Institute and this discourse, uh, this this global narrative that continues to evolve around you know what it means to be urban. Uh, do you have any any thoughts uh, of that and any 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 ideas? Yes. So by the way, uh, when our company started, our very first project was actually in Santa Fe. We built an amazing uh, place that you could live in, you could work in, you could sell in there, you could manufacture. It had like this universal zoning that allowed everything called Second Street Studios that still exists to this day. Um, I think institutes like the Santa Fe Institute are extraordinarily important. These are places of thought, of deep thought, that are connected to action. So 20 years ago, my wife and I were given a monastery an hour north of New York City. And we created some, a similar place called the Garrison Institute. It's in Garrison, New York. And we asked, what is the monastery of the 21st century? And we asked many people, including His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and His Holiness said, it's a place that connects the contemplative wisdom of all faiths with outer action in the world and in environment and civil society. And so the that's what the Institute does. The Institute nurtures, we host amazing teachers of deep lineage faith traditions, of many, many different faiths, but very deep retreats on site in this old monastery. We can sleep up to 175 people, but we also have a whole series of programs and um, uh, that take these ideas into the world. We just celebrated our 20th anniversary and soon appearing on our website will be, uh, we had an all day symposium at Rockefeller University, another great research university um, on the idea of metamorphosis on the idea of societal change. Um, societies them too, cells are often too busy to think about societal change. So having institutes that can actually, we're, uh, I love this, uh, mountain, monastery, and metropolis. But so having institutes that have become sanctuaries from the world, but whose purpose is to serve the world, I think makes an enormous amount of sense. Well, we're on almost on time, but thank you for that. And I know we have two more questions. So I'm going to suggest that we take the emails of uh, these two members of the audience so that we can send them to you. And I know you will answer them because I don't think we'll be able to do justice to the two questions. But I, I actually wanted to answer you, you since you've invoked the value of these institutes. I just wanted to thank NUS Cities, actually, which enabled this today. I gave a copy of your book to Professor Ku Teng Chai, uh, who not only read it, but contacted you and enabled this wonderful discussion. So I uh, just wanted to thank him and, and the rest of the team that enabled it. And my very last question is on music. What's on your playlist? Right now, what are you listening to? Uh, okay. So I, I have in a love box, Bach and Bach's Well-Tempered Clavier. But uh, I had to get up early this morning. And on my, um, on my phone, my wake-up music is something called uh, uh, Piece One, Piece Two by John McLaughlin. John McLaughlin is a great guitarist. And uh, we put out an album called In a Silent Way. I'm sorry, um, Miles Davis put out an album that John McLaughlin plays on called In a Silent Way. So that's similar to uh, John McLaughlin put out called My Goals Beyond. These are both records from the, the 60s or early 70s. But In a Silent Way uh, by Miles Davis and John McLaughlin's My Goals Beyond, uh, they have been long on my playlist and I would recommend them to everybody. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to hand it back to Sanjana, but Jonathan, this was a real honor and a privilege. Thank you so much. And thank you for India Cities. Thank you so much, Mr. Rose, for giving us your valuable time and to share your amazing work 
and thoughts and ideas. I mean, I can safely say this was one of the most optimistic and inspiring session I have ever seen. Um, this is my personal opinion, but yeah. Um, we would also like to thank Mr. Anupam Yog for his time. Very insightful questions as well as moderations of the session. I mean, I think we've all learned a lot even from the q and session. Thank you everyone for attending this event and actively participating with your questions. We are also pleased to inform you about our next lecture on 5th Feb by Mr. Tim Stoner, Managing Director of Space and Tax. Do register for the same at the earliest since we have limited seats at the U Hall Auditorium. Um, also, please watch out for our social media channels as well as your emails where we'll be informing you about initiatives.